February to the February um, Let's Talk Talent Manufacturing webinar that we've been putting on. So uh, welcome everybody. I, I know we haven't done this one. We didn't do this since December. So normally what we do is we um, actually let everybody kind of introduce themselves and say, you know, who they are and why they're here. And um, we'll do, uh, Bernie, what do we normally do? Do we normally start with, uh, um, we'll let Adam introduce himself before he actually speaks. But um, did you want to have like the manufacturing sector partnership people introduce themselves first? Yeah, that'd be great. Just so okay, that you guys know who's. Yeah, yeah Molly, you want to kind of kick things off for us? Sure. My name is Molly Lucas, and I'm the HR manager at AJ Rose Manufacturing, and also one of the co-chairs of the Lorain County Manufacturing Sector Partnership. Uh, Aaron, you want to? Hi, Aaron Lavin, HR manager at Togus Products in Avon Lake, and uh, chair of the membership committee on the partnership. Judith, you want to pop in there? Or, uh, I'm Judith Crocker. I am working with the Lorain County Manufacturing Sector Partnership. I'm a member and also helping to, to staff as we're implementing some of our grants and the work we're doing here in Lorain County. Um, I will turn it over to Bernie right now and then Bernie can um, uh, have everybody else who's on here who is not part of the Manufacturing Sector Partnership maybe introduce themselves as well too, but we'll have Bernie introduce her. Uh, okay, so hi, I'm Bernie Goski at Lorraine County Community College. We I think we all know each other. Maybe uh, Christy and Emma uh, aren't as familiar to me, but we'll learn more about them. Um, what we're trying to do is, is part of this initiative is just providing some talent solutions and learning from the good thing, the good work that's underway right within our region. I mean, you know, we have our colleagues from Magnet here. So, um, um, but before we get to Magnet, I want to um, have a chance for Emma. Uh, to introduce herself, Emma. Hi, I'm Human Resources at NN Inc., which is a manufacturer in Wellington. Um, I'm not too familiar with this group or anything. I got the email that was forwarded to me from the former HR manager here, Jenny. So I'm um, just kind of here just to learn and see what it's about. So awesome. That's perfect. And Christy? Looks like she's still connecting. Okay. I was wondering if she might be on the phone. Um, there is somebody on the phone. Oh, they just yep. hung up. Yeah, so the person on the phone is Christy. She works with me here at AJ Rose oh, Manufacturing. Okay. Okay. okay, great. All right, so kick it in over to um, to Adam and, and Debbie to talk about, um, you know, the, the common denominator here, just like in Cairo County, is that um, it's just really hard to, uh, to to tap talent right now and to to locate uh, folks who would be a really good fit uh, for manufacturing and um, so kind of you know leaving no stone unturned I know you've had tremendous success with the um, with the um, second chance hiring and and other initiatives there so just you know kind of walk us through that and um, noting that this is recorded and will be shared out with other members who were not able and, and other employers who are not able, um, and Emma, just to be clear, you didn't have to be part of the Lorain County Sector Manufacturing Sector Partnership to join this. Um, we're delighted that uh, that our manufacturers are with us on this call. Fitz, did you want to introduce yourself real quickly before you start? Before we start? Sure. Let me not make the uh, traditional gaffe of being muted while talking. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Michael Fitzpatrick. I'm the executive director of the Lorraine County Manufacturing Sector Partnership, uh, and I'm so pleased to be here uh, with uh, old members, potential new members, and anybody, frankly, who's interested in being a part of uh, solutions when it comes to our communities and getting folks working. Great. Thanks. So Adam and Debbie? Great. Thanks. Uh, so I will kick off. My name is Adam Snyder. Uh, I work at Magnet and Debbie from my team will introduce herself and her background uh, as we get into things. So we, as a part of Magnet, we play a very specific and geographically centered role. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about who Magnet is, but then our role as the sector partnership in intermediary, which a lot of the familiar faces on here will understand that nuance better than most audiences, uh, given your familiarity with the sector partnership model. 
Uh, I'm going to share screen now, but I'm also going to preface this conversation with um, I'm very glad that this is a small and mighty group because Debbie and I are both very informal presenters by nature and would value any questions or discussion you guys want to go off on a tangent on. Um, our core topic today, we're going to talk about one particular work stream in the sector partnership work in Cuyahoga County, uh, a program called Access to Manufacturing Careers. And uh, we'll give a little background on the origins of it, the content of the program, results to date, and our goals going forward. Uh, but as I mentioned, please interrupt either a digital hand raise. I have everybody's face on my screen. I should be able to see if you have a physical hand raise uh, or come off mute to talk. So for those of you um, that are familiar with the sector partnership model, I'll do a quick background. Sector partnership as an employer-owned, employer-led initiative is not a new concept. Sector partnerships have been around 10 plus years in various parts of the country. And in Cuyahoga County actually has its roots about five years ago when uh, eight or nine of our, of our county's key funders in the workforce space got together, formed a collaborative group, did a bunch of research about how they could affect the talent gap in Cuyahoga County and actually sector partnership being the first model that they landed on wanting to launch. Um, now at this point, uh, we can talk about now three sector partnerships have been launched in Cuyahoga County. Manufacturing was the first and Magnet and GCP were selected as co-intermediaries of that work um, and ultimately led to our first step, which was recruit a manufacturing leadership team. So we have a dozen owner seats. CEO level manufacturing leaders that sit on our manufacturing leadership team. And the relevance to this discussion is that the first step in that sector partnership process was to engage those leaders in the setting of the vision and selection of the strategies for the sector partnership. Those folks generally sit, um, continue, I would say almost 100% of them still are on our manufacturing leadership team three years later, uh, have driven a lot of this work and owned it the whole way through. and. Given that 90% plus of the folks on this uh, call are familiar with the sector partnership model, I'll touch on this super briefly. Our role is really uh, the true term of intermediary. It is I'll facilitate the, the direction that our employers wanna go, help pull together the partners and align around what the manufacturers are looking for, uh, and then facilitate funding resources, partners, uh, and various synergistic strategies in the ecosystem to try and achieve those things. Uh, so we sit in this complicated uh, web of different stakeholders and different contributors to the process. And at its core, a number of things emerged as the manufacturers were setting their strategies. One was, there's a no surprise to anybody on this call, there was a dramatic need for entry level hiring and manufacturing many of our manufacturers had really robust and mature internal training systems uh, and programs that if, if we got a good person into them entry level, they'd have opportunities to upskill, to learn, to progress into machining and maintenance and supervision pathways. Uh, and really the need two and a half years ago when the strategies were set where we, we really want, we, uh, we we want to be investing more in our folks and we don't have the backfill at the entry level to, to free them up. The other intersecting observation was as the manufacturers really dug into what does our workforce look like and um, plenty of data and information uh, available on this, but generally manufacturers uh, are very heavy in white older males. And in particular, the manufacturer said, if we're going to be successful, both in having a diverse productive workforce and in the volume of workforce we need, we need to be better at recruiting from populations that we have struggled historically and set a primary objective around recruiting uh, people of color, young adults and women more effectively. Each of them uh, in Cuyahoga County, African-Americans are about half underrepresented in manufacturing versus the total workforce. Similarly, about half represented for women versus the total workforce. Uh, on the young adult side, in Cuyahoga County, about 30% of manufacturing employees are 55 and over, 
and about 6% are 25 and under. So there's a huge gap statistically in our ability to draw young people in uh, as well as um, people of color and women. And so this first strategy that, that hit, hit rocket boosters early on was around creating innovative on-ramps for these target populations. Uh, and the underlying element to this was we, we want to help people get into manufacturing. We want them to be a good fit. We know it's not the right fit for everybody. We want to help people find the right fit in manufacturing. Um, and, and there's a number of elements of this, but where uh, the focus ended up landing initially was around re-entry. We had a couple manufacturers on the MLT that had a history of hiring second chance and were able to speak peer to peer of, you know, I've hired some folks that had a felony on their, on their background check and they knew that I was giving them a chance and they've become some of my most loyal, most uh, prophetic employees. Uh, and they've been fantastic. And it really it created a groundswell with the manufacturers of let's figure this out, not only because we think there's opportunity around retention and loyalty, but uh, A, competitively, it's a great spot for manufacturing because there's other industries, healthcare, financial services that have barriers for people with a background uh, and can't hire. And also the demographics that the manufacturers were looking to target that were underrepresented on African-Americans being the most, uh, most blatant in the statistics, re-entry population is way overrepresented with African-Americans. So it really was a great intersection of if we can do this well, and the, that innovative on-ramps kind of became a, a rallying cry, let's do something that not only is great for the individuals and for the community and manufacturers, let's do it in a way that makes a bit of a splash, because we also know that manufacturers, uh, We've historically had a perception gap around whether manufacturing was a good place to go, but really the biggest thing is an awareness gap. If we can make a splash and more people learn about manufacturing and, oh, manufacturing is doing this great thing around helping people in our community, besides uh, great jobs and advancement and economic mobility, it'll only help to add momentum. So at the point where the manufacturer said, yep, let's, let's do this, and then they kind of turn to us as the intermediary team and say, oh, how do we do this now? Uh, I'm going to introduce Debbie to give a little bit of her background uh, and then talk talk through here's the process over the last two years or so to really operationalize this strategy. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. So um, I'm Debbie Perkle, work at Magnet with Adam, and um, my background is workforce development. I've had a long history of uh, working in di different organizations in um, healthcare and um, construction and now manufacturing with workforce development. And so I was really excited to come on the team and help lead this initiative. So um, just to emphasize a little bit about what Adam was saying is that there, um, in that one slide with all those little bubbles, there's a lot of um, organizations and companies and agencies involved in this initiative. And one of the key indicators of success is that um, everybody's in it because they see value in it for them. Like we didn't like pay anybody to be involved. We didn't like coerce anybody to be involved. We just like laid our case out and said, would you like to be part of this? And those who are participating are willingly participating because they see that there's a lot of value in this process. And the more that we're going forward and having positive results, the more buy-in we're getting from the original organizations as well as new people coming on board. So um, I just wanna throw that out there. Um, and so even with all of those different organizations involved, um, and we want to make sure that each uh, layer feels very, very important because each, each partner sort of um, sector is uh, critical to the success of the program, the employers are actually driving the process. And so that's really what we're showing on this slide here is that we, br we brought the manufacturing leadership team together and said, what do you need in an entry level employee? Like what's, what are the skills that you're seeing are lacking when people come off the street and apply for your jobs? And so they were able to um, identify some very specific things that they needed, some skills, behaviors, et cetera, that they wanted their, their uh, first employees to have. And so then they laid those out and then we reviewed a whole bunch of curriculum and then chose um, and created a curriculum to go with. And what we chose were some um, specific modules from Precision Metal Forming Association's uh, uh, platform. And then we brought on Towards Employment as a training provider, and they are using their job readiness curriculum that's 
um, contextualized to manufacturing. And then we have, um, so those are the pieces that the manufacturing said, manufacturer said that that's what they want. So it's a very, very specific curriculum that is meeting what the employers said that they wanted. And then we turned to the employers and said, okay, um, we will teach this curriculum, but we need some things from you. For example, people are going through this class and that means that they need to get hired as quickly as possible when the class is over because they don't have income while they're doing the class um, and they want to get to work. So could you please um, shorten your time of um, interview to hire, for example, um, have some common hiring processes, which they agreed to. Um, and then we went to the workforce development organizations in Cleveland and said, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a great opportunity for the clients you're working with. This is a new career pathway um, to get people into manufacturing. Would you like to participate? And so they said yes. And so they're recruiting their own clients to go to um, the access program. And then towards employment and precision metal forming association is teaching the classes. And then once the um, people finish the class, they are interviewed by 20 plus companies and then they have an accelerated time to hire um, and, and onboarding in those companies. So that's the whole entire process. Um, and it took us a while to come up with it, uh, but it's working really well. So what does the actual class look like? So it is four weeks of training, total of 120 hours. 50 of those hours are using the PMA platform and it's online. We give everybody a um, computer and a hotspot so that uh, the technology isn't an issue. And we actually walk through them, through it with them to make sure that they know how to use it and they have the right um, tools and set up so they can get into the platform. Um, because of COVID, because um, we were supposed to start in March of 2020 and that didn't happen because of COVID. So we actually started and switched everything to online. Um, and then we started in the end of June of 2020. So the whole PMA part is online. And then we have 50 hours of soft skill and work readiness training through towards employment. And then 20 hours are employer led. And the uh, 20 hours employer led include hands on instruction that happened at Magnet that you can see in this photo here. And then we also have um, sort of like employer showcases where companies can come in and brag about their company, talk about their, um, their work environment, et cetera. And then we have an OJT checklist that goes with the graduate to their new employment where the employer can validate the skills that they learned in the class. <clears throat> and the benefit of this OJT checklist is that quite often a first job at a company doesn't re necessarily require all the skills that they learned in the class, but doing the OJT checklist lets the supervisor understand the level of um, skill that a person has. And then we've seen graduates accelerate in their jobs with promotions and cross training much more quickly than people who are coming in off the street. Debbie, what, then, Debbie, what do you use for the lab at Magnet? You said they, they do some in-person stuff. So are they engaged with any equipment? Um, is it still computer-based? So it's um, hands-on instruction with um, volunteer instructors from the different companies. Mm -hmm. And so they have um, a session on safety, a session on um, shop math, uh, metrology, um, basic print reading, and maybe even more. I, mean, I think those are the main things. And, so they don't um, have any, I guess what I was trying to understand, so they don't have any specific interaction with equipment other than using, you know, like things like blue, sample blueprints or using measuring with metrology, that kind of stuff. Right. So, right. That, so, right. so for metrology, they learn how to use calipers and micrometers mm -hmm. and they have um, prints and uh, like physical objects that they use to sort of translate the print to the physical object. Cool, like thank that. you. Mm -hmm. hey, Debbie, I have a question about those um, laptops and hotspots. Uh, yeah. Where'd you get the funding to, to provide that? So our first class, um, we provided that, but since then we've gotten all of our computers and hotspots from PCs for People. Nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. Uh, the interview day happens 
on the second to last day of class. Um, all of the inner, all of the, and because of COVID, it's all been happening over Zoom, but um, Towards Employment facilitates the scheduling of the first interviews. So uh, graduates can go and have like three or four interviews during that day. And then the employers choose who they wanna follow up with the last day of class is graduation. And then the following week are follow-up interviews. And then um, ideally offers are made within the next week after that, and then they, they get started. So one of the really exciting parts of the program is the employer engagement. And I've been so impressed with how employers are stepping up and enthusiastic to be part of the program. Um, they are seeing their, the more that they're engaged, the more they're able to make really good hiring decisions, meaning that they come to, they come to Magnet on the hands-on days. So they're seeing people in person and they are able to identify who's really engaged, who's interested, who's asking questions. And that gives them a sense of like targeting people to, um, to want to interview. So even if the, whether it's um, an instructor who's coming to teach print reading, or if it's um, an employer coming to do a showcase to talk about their company, they'll report back to the hiring manager, listen, you should take a look at these people because they were super engaged and really interested. Um, and so there's a lot of different opportunities to engage with the students. And um, we've actually had to kind of cut back on the number of companies who are engaged because we don't even have enough space for the companies that want to sort of preview the, the students. Uh, the other thing is that this idea of agreeing to a minimum wage range and a common hiring process is really critical because if, um, they, if people get into their regular recruitment process, they're going to get lost or they're going to just get strung along and they're not going to get quick employment. And that's really discouraging for people when they need to get into jobs quickly. And so we, we keep in touch with the hiring managers and the HR people um, very, very closely. And we push them when needed to make hiring decisions and to push up start dates so that people can get started working. And it's worked very well. Um, and then we have quarterly uh, HR roundtable meetings with all the HR folks so that we can just report out on what's happening with the class. And then a really big part of access is just iterating and just making sure that it gets better and better each time. And so we've, through these HR uh, roundtables, we've been able to identify additional tools and processes that make the, the process more smooth and seamless for the, um, for the companies. So what are the, some of the success factors, which there's quite a lot, but one, one really important thing is roles and responsibilities documents and having everybody be on the same page on who's doing what, because we have so many different partners, different um, companies, different nonprofit organizations. And so we have, um, we drew up a, um, a roles and responsibility form of like, what the workforce development organizations were gonna do, what the employers were going to do, what towards employment was going to do and everything is there. And so if we ever run into any problems, we can go back to that document and go and sort of identify who's doing what and just make sure that people are on the same page. Um, we've, as I said, you know, having the employers change some of their hiring processes and practices, um, people are very open about sharing um, information. Um, for example, in our last HR roundtable, um, people were asking about um, retention bonuses or referral bonuses because of the labor issues right now. And companies are sharing internal processes with each other and policies, um, which is really, really great and helpful to everyone. Uh, this OJT checklist that I spoke about has been a really important factor in um, accelerating advancement in companies. And then finally, Towards Employment provides a, a career coach who um, averts um, any kind of like write-ups or terminations when things happen that need to be worked out. So those are some of the success factors. Debbie, yeah, I mean, thanks, that's great. A couple of quick questions. The OJT checklist, is that a common checklist among all of the companies? Are the jobs that you are training for similar across all the companies? Um, and then my third question is, have you guys figured out what's the cost 
like per person from when you recruit until they actually get placed and then retained? Okay, so for the OJT checklist, it's kind of, it's so the OJT checklist, um, it reflects the, the skills and knowledge that people would have gained through taking the, um, the course. It doesn't, it's not a reflection on the job they're going into. And so quite often people's jobs may not, mostly they won't use all the skills that they learn. It's really a validation and, and showcasing to the employer what they've learned so that they can say, oh, I didn't know they learned this. Maybe they can do this job also, or we can move them up more quickly because we see they have a background in this, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the cost from beginning to end, I'm going to I'm going to defer to Adam if he knows that. Yeah, I think there, there's probably two layers of answer there. One is delivery cost. We have a really good understanding on um, it's the program is on the Wyatt list and we are eligible. So part of the definition of that is what is the cost to deliver. Um, and the, I would say the variable part, the, the interesting part of your question to me is on the recruitment side, I would say the, the cost to recruit has varied quite a bit from January 2020 to now. Um, I'd say the, that first cohort that was scheduled to start the third week of March in 2020, uh, we had 120, 110 applicants for that first class. Um, and as a lot of folks on here, and that was, that was just good partner coordination. We weren't hard spending recruitment dollars. It was literally intermediary function, getting the partners together, communicating, holding info sessions, um, in, in a current world we're we're now investing a lot more in some digital marketing pilots in canvassing and outreach in 22. As we look to scale this, and we'll talk about outcomes and, and scale plans. Um, the cost to recruit is definitely the element that is that has changed significantly. Thanks. So it is approved by WIA, and therefore each participant who is enrolled, WIA will cover the training costs and pay magnet. Uh, towards, towards employment, towards employment is the we or is the Wyatt List approved trainer, and okay. they're also. Um, they're also the training provider locally. So the WIOA funding from OMJ, for example, uh, is to towards employment. We, we play the intermediary role in partner coordination. We facilitated the design with them and, and we are still uh, responsible for employer engagement and, um, and partner management, but we are, we are not a training provider. One of, one of our core methodologies from a sector partnership standpoint is Anywhere, anywhere we can elevate partners, uh, that is our first priority. And we have plenty of workforce agencies and training providers in town. So really want to not duplicate that. Good thinking. And then in terms of, of course, you know, I know the history about the partners all coming together, um, philanthropy. So I believe they're still contributing to the whole strategy for Workforce Connect in Cuyahoga County. So that funding then that comes from those partners to Magnet, that offsets Magnet's costs. Is that how that works? And then the training costs are covered by WIA? The, so the Two elements of your question there. So the, the funders group is a, a portion of our sector partnership capacity funding. Uh, programmatically, the funding for access is a majority WIOA. Uh, there's some other public streams depending on the qualifications of the individual, whether that's WIOA or CCMEP or um, ODJFS type of sources. The employers also contribute to this, uh, we essentially modeled the employer contribution uh, similar to a placement fee because manufacturers are kind of used to placement agencies and temp fees. So the employers get an invoice uh, upon hire and another invoice upon 90 day retention. Uh, and that, that uh, employer contribution mechanism funds the gap. Uh, there's always a funding gap on WIOA stuff just because you have candidates that aren't eligible or have already used their WIOA funding. Uh, so, um, you know, in, in startup mode, we used some some philanthropic dollars to fund fund some of the gaps. But now that we're in in operation, um, the the public funding sources and then 
the employer contribution generally make up the cost of the program. Yeah. And is that standard depend regardless of the size of the company? Um, so each yeah. so they have two payment points, the employer does, one upon hire and then one upon 90 day retention. Correct. Right. And can you tell us how much that is? We're currently at one of them is 500 and one's a thousand. So generally we were targeting half of the cost of a 90 day temp overhead uh, to make sure that we were adding value. Some of the manufacturers have said, hey, for sustainability, this is too low. Uh, <laughs> and we, we may revisit as we scale. Um, but so far we, we've been okay at that current level. Yeah. And, and again, I, that's something, you know, that we'll talk here in Lorain County, how that fits in with what, especially many of our smaller manufacturers, how that might, might work for them. So, and then you guys also get county money, right? Through Workforce Connect for Cuyahoga County? Uh, they're part of the funders group. Okay, yeah. They're, they're part of the pool of fund. Thank you. And this, you know, also Adam, this initiative is supported by the Department of Labor also? Yeah, so from a, from a synergy standpoint, the, the capacity to execute is a, is a nice intersection between what our, what our local stakeholders and philanthropy and public entities are looking for. Uh, we worked, I give Debbie all the credit for the vision to make sure that this was a WIOA approved credential from the start because it solves a lot of sustainability challenges, uh, but it also is, sits at the intersection of what we're trying to accomplish with the scaling apprenticeship grant in that you know, it's a it's an from a demonstration grant standpoint it's employer led it's employer centric it's an earn and learn model uh, and it's targeting the the populations that we're we're really hoping to draw in um, so we are we are um, building this out in the context of of meeting a lot of those different check boxes as well hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. So really quick, and this might be a really stupid question, but um, so for someone who is in HR um, for 17 years now, when I started, I was, I was always said, hey, you bring in someone with a background that's got violence in it, you name it, you, something happens to another one of your employees, you're liable. How, how does that work now with a program like this? I mean, are there still like levels of, uh, you can't, I mean, how, how does that work? So I'll put an asterisk on nothing that Debbie or I share is legal advice. And I would always encourage everybody to work with their company's leadership and, and lawyers. But I can tell you that um, the path that the employers are on that are engaged with this program, which is not all, uh, we've got 20, 25 employers that are engaged with access. Easily, Debbie and I have talked to 50, 60, 70 companies that have shown interest, and the rest aren't a good fit for any number of reasons. Uh, one of those being the employers that are really engaged on the second chance hiring look at it as uh, that the process itself and the design of the program is a validation of attitude and aptitude and interest. and to one one conversation with an employer of okay so how do I know that this person won't do X Y and Z once I hire them and my easy response typically is well how well do you know the person you hired yesterday you had a ten minute phone screen and a thirty minute interview and you looked at a resume that they gave you and you ran a background check these folks have been screened rigorously by a partner that knows this population as well as anybody in the region. They've gone through a, a fairly intense four-week program. They're committed. They've interviewed with you um, that this is, a, this is a better bet. To your specific question about legal liability, um, there, there are mechanisms that, that companies can go down the path of to minimize some of that. Um, and that some of those, I think, perpet my own editorial, some of those perpetuate the issue and the stigmas that we're talking about. Um, but I think to me, the, the key difference between the initial thought leaders on this and the bulk of the manufacturers that are bought in is that everybody embracing, you know what, 
if they tell me what happened and when it happened and why it happened and they're upfront about it and it matches what's on the background check, great. And they're committed to everybody's made mistakes and you've served your time and you've committed and you've made it through this process to know that you're a good match competency and, and attitude wise, I'm excited. And, and to that goodwill uh, and that message from the employers is one of the most impactful things for the students as well. Debbie, is there anything else you want to add on? Um, I would also, I would just say that um, at the beginning we had, I think, three companies who already are hiring people who've been incarcerated and said they want to continue to hire. And then they, their like willingness and excitement about it brought in a couple other companies. And then that number has been climbing um, because people are seeing that it works. But we also... Um, we also did two different education workshops for employers um, that were led by Towards Employment. And the first workshop would um, address very specifically what you're talking about, liability and, um, and risk and legal implications. And I can't speak to those, but Towards Employment, that's their expertise area. And so they talk through all of those different things. They brought in an attorney, et cetera. And then the second workshop was um, about culture and about integrating people who've been in, in prison into your company. And we had um, some speakers, uh, we, had, we had some speakers who are working in manufacturing who have been incarcerated and they talked about sort of like the state of mind of somebody coming out of prison and things that um, they found to be useful in their company to help them integrate. Um, and so I think that those two workshops were really helpful in, um, breaking down the barriers of people who, um, who might be a little reticent. And then the third thing is that for every company that says that they want to be an access employer, uh, Towards Employment talks to them to see what, um, what their risk tolerance is and what convictions they would feel uncomfortable not having work for them. And so then they'll be presented with people who, you know, with people who have the, the acceptable um, convictions and they won't see anybody who they don't want to. And then the other thing is, and this is the last thing I say on it. Every company was like, I'll, I'll hire anybody who um, has a background as long as it's not a violent offense. And the truth is, is that most of the people who come through access have a violent offense, but it's the story behind that offense that makes the difference in yes or no. And so that's been a really important component of the, um, the vetting and the interview process is what the person's story is. And like what Adam said, their motivation and their rehabilitation. Got it. Makes sense. That, that was a really long answer. So, but. No, I appreciate it. Cause that to me is something that um, when you're in, you know, told that and told that and told that as an HR person, when you hear something that, like this, it's just, you've got to change your mindset. And, and so I just was trying to figure out how, how that, and I, I think it also differs at workplaces. I I've, I've actually had employees that have called me. I mean, there's so much that you can access online now. You know, we've hired someone, some second class kind of just like on our own. Like we we're like, okay, that was, you know, 10 years ago. Let obviously there's nothing recent. And I've had people call and say, oh, so now you've hired a rapist? What are, what's next? And we and I'm kind of like, how'd they know that? And it's just like they they can they can get information and they're they're gonna do it. So, you know, I think towards employment doing that kind of stuff to work with you is a good thing. So um, then I think it, it puts more in for the employer to be able to deal with that kind of stuff, which is, that's good to know. So thank you. I think, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one company uh, was hired one person out of the first class and they wanted to hire two, but they were like, I don't want to hire two people out of this first class because they're going to each know that they, what their backgrounds are. And if they get in a fight, they're going to like out the other person and it's just going to cause a lot of problems. So we're just going to hire one person. Well, that same company now has hired one to two people out of every single class because they see that it's not an issue, that the people who are coming on board um, are, you know, they've, they've turned the corner on whatever their background was and they're ready to be productive members of society and they're superstars in that company. So awesome. I think it's just time, yeah. Um, okay, so just to run through a couple of different pieces 
um, elements of the, of the program, just so you guys can have more of a full picture. We do offer stipends during the class. Um, that, that structure and model of stipends is, is actually changing right now because we found that some people were going through the class just to get the stipend. And there were a number of people who chose not to accept job offers because they just wanted the stipend. So we've changed that. We still do get a stipend, but it's, it's spaced out differently now. Um, and also we have so many companies, as Adam said, that want to be an access employer. And it gives us the luxury really and the, um, the benefit of being able to really showcase and highlight the high road employers, the good quality uh, companies who are offering you know, good, rate, good wages and benefits that have a good culture and that who are dedicated to um, further training and developing these, their employees. So if we, so we really want to make manufacturing be an attractive field and an attractive career for lots of people. And a big part of that is word of mouth. And so anytime somebody goes into a great company, they're going to tell all their family and friends, and that's going to per further perpetuate the, um, the, the um, reputation of manufacturing as a career. And then we get more and more people going through there. So we make sure that people who are going, that the students are going into really good companies. And that's been really um, very successful also. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, and so the results. So these are the results that we've had. Um, I, I think that we've said a number of times that COVID really threw a, um, a monkey wrench into our plans, but we are really excited that the numbers that we have are better than other workforce development programs and our results are really terrific. Um, one of the, you know, knock on wood, one of our biggest stats is that we've had zero recidivism among our graduates and it's been going on um, over a year and a half now. So um, we're really excited about that. And our number of employers continues to, to rise faster than the number of people that we can get because of the labor situation right now. The, the one thing I'd touch on as we transition into the forward look is that uh, we get a lot of questions around what's our placement rate, what's our retention rate, what's our racial demographic split. Um, the one that's not on here, actually 30% of our graduates have been women, which is overrepresentative for manufacturing. Um, but the, the stories from the manufacturers and from the individuals end up being a really great part. You've got uh, Corey in this particular picture who's working at Jurgens right now and is now just an advocate for manufacturing. Um, he was actually on a, a NAM webinar nationwide uh, maybe eight months ago, could not have been more nervous to speak on a nationwide webinar, but did a fantastic job. Um, and the, the story, some of the folks that you saw in other pictures, just lighten it up, just doing really well and making that much more of a case for the employers to come back and hire. Not, not to say, you know, you, you look at 90 day retention at 70%. Um, there are folks that get all the way in and, and it's not a good fit or, or doesn't work out, but all in all, the employers keep saying, you know, it's we take it hard when somebody doesn't work out. And the employer's saying, Yeah, this one didn't work out, but this one did. And I want I want to keep hiring. And so the demand is far outpacing the the supply. So for for 2022, um, we are we're targeting 200 graduates. Um, we are very obviously looking to scale at a time when supply is not. Uh, ripe for that. So we're actually, we're pulling a lot of levers. I mentioned uh, we're putting investment into digital marketing and social media. Uh, we're, we're also putting some investment into grassroots. And when I say grassroots outreach, literally canvassing door-to-door -door community organization, um, not us, but in the sector partnership spirit, we're, we're looking at what organizations have community relationships and could use some extra capacity or, um, could do could integrate our uh, our program into their existing work. Um, we're also looking at a couple of different models besides the workforce organizations drawing supply or community organizations drawing supply. We're also looking at a couple of models where potentially the folks that are applying to manufacturers and the manufacturer, you know, out of, Molly puts a posting up and gets forty applicants and phone screens eight and hires two. There's probably a bunch of those that 
could work out, but they're not quite ready or they don't present well in a resume or a phone screen, those might be great candidates for access. Uh, and probably, and a lot of them aren't engaged in the workforce ecosystem. So that, that right population for a mechanism, sometimes you hear the word reverse referral, um, those mechanisms may are, are something we're looking to capitalize on with some of our committed employers. So I have a couple other quick questions. Um, you indicated the uh, a lot of the PMA content is online. Have you found these individuals do pretty well? Do you have tutors that uh, monitor their progress and intervene as needed? Yes, that's a short answer. <laughs> yeah, T instructors are, are working with them. Great, thanks. And then with the stipend, how, how does that go? Is it just a flat fee per week? Is it based on hours of participation? Um, so we frame it as people can earn a stipend and the stipend is earned by class attendance and participation and on time completion of assignments. And that, that funding comes from which source that you guys pull from? So that's braided. So that's partially from WIOA, the stipend that's um, from there, and partially through the um, the employer contributions that Adam talked about previously. Okay. Thanks. This wasn't a shy group about asking questions midstream, but you know you got to have a slide at the end with a good picture and a, and a request for more questions. So. Uh, may, maybe it got asked, um, what, what is that stipend if it's not crude for me to ask the amount? We, we generally modeled it uh, based on the 120 hour program around 10 or $12 an hour uh, okay. because a portion of the class is in person and therefore finite number of hours. A portion <laughs> of the class is synchronous virtual classroom with their cohort and the instructor and a portion of it is asynchronous learning. Uh, it doesn't necessarily equate to an hourly rate, but we definitely knew that if somebody's working a part-time fast food job and want to commit to doing the program, they may have a hard time doing leaving that job if they're not making generally equivalent wages while they're in class. I'm going to hop in here and um, um, just we had some, some folks joined since we originally uh, started this meeting and I just wanted to take an opportunity to see um, Jess, um, can you, do you want to introduce yourself and where you're from? Uh, hi, let me start, let me see if I can start the video. See me. Okay. All right, uh, my name is Jess Jacob. I am from St. Cobain. Um, I've always been interested in this topic and it's got nothing to do with my job really. I'm in marketing really, um, strategic marketing, uh, not in HR, but it's just a topic that I've been very interested in uh, for a while. I think I attended one of your sessions several years ago um, and popped it in my email. I just wanted to see what was going on in the sector, especially during COVID. Uh, so it's very, very nice to hear all the work that you are doing. And uh, I don't know how and when, uh, and I think it's a great need. My company is looking for talent too. Um, and, uh, but we are on the other side. We are, our manufacturing plant is in Hiram, Ohio, quite away from Lorraine. Um, but 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 I think it's just for me, it's an educational session just to see uh, what's going on in the rest of Ohio and how and when my company could benefit from it. Um, so Welcome. that's all. Thank Welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. And, and Tina, how about you? Hi, I'm Tina Hazlett. I'm with Lorain County JVS. Um, I work predominantly right now with the Adult Career Center, but I represent the entire district. Um, part of um, this was a very interesting topic for us. Um, we are um, venturing into working with our career-based correctional facility and providing them with um, information about their educational uh, post-secondary educational opportunities with us and then but we want to know what that next step could be for them in regards to a second chance hiring like okay so now you have the skills and the trade and the certification can you get a job 
And so um, that's a big piece of that, but just, you know, overall within our district to have these connections and to um, foster this type of um, movement, should I say, um, I think it's fabulous. Everything I heard was, you know, with the, you know, the job coach um, that perked my ears, that's key. Um, I we even find that key to even our high school with our inner high schoolers, you know, uh, having those job coaches that are available to them when they're starting out in their careers um, with these new credentials and this newness to them. Um, is, is a benefit because some things can be avoided right away. Um, you know, oh, somebody's not going to get terminated immediately. We're going to, you know, let's talk about this. Let's learn from this instead of just immediately saying, okay, you're out of here. So, you know, I love, I love that aspect of it. Um, I, I, yeah, very interesting. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to listen to the recording again and just get as much more information as I can. So thanks for um, having me on this today. And um, it's, it's been a great learning opportunity. That's great. Join us anytime, Tina. Really happy to have you with us. And Kendra? Hello. Um, I uh, was part of the um, partnership uh, at a former employer, and uh, I got the invite and wanted to sit in and learn more about the program. Um, are we going to be sent a, a link to the recording? Because I'd love to share it with some of you know the higher up decision makers. Um, and, uh, you know, who better to present it than the group that presented it here? It, sure. it, will, it will actually get posted to the Lorraine County Manufacturing Sector Partnership YouTube page, and we will send out an email um, with that link. So you'll have access to it. And I, it'd probably be a good time to let everybody know that all of our previous webinars are also on that YouTube page. So if there's another topic or something else that um, you might be interested in, um, that's what, where they'll be located, and you can view them and share them as you see fit as well, too. Hey, uh, Kendra, am I remembering correctly? Are you with Stanley Black & Decker? I am with Stanley Black & Decker. I thought I remember your name from a previous gathering. Um, don't worry, there's still time. You can absolutely rejoin LCMSP. We're happy to have you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Shameless plug, shameless plug. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> So, all right, any other questions or, or conversation to be uh, generated as a result of this? Um, you know, just kind of thinking about our, our uh, employer partners and um, has this whet your appetite a bit for, for, for this model? I think so. I think it was a great, great learning session, which is nice. I think the way Adam described it with a small but mighty group and one uh, a group size where you can ask questions and actually go back and forth. Um, I, I have to say that out of the six or so that we've done, this was probably the most interactive. Um, and it's the way we had, Bernie and I had kind of intended these to be. Um, this is probably the first one that has probably come out the way we wanted it to be like this, as far as, you know, getting questions and getting answers and and having everybody actually participate. So um, thank you. I do have I, one other question. Go ahead, Judy. Sorry, just what role does Manufacturing Works play in the work that you're doing in Cuyahoga County? Specific to access or in general? Uh, either one, I think specific to access for sure. Uh, well, specific to access, I would say a number of their um, uh, member employers are engaged with access. Um, okay. and sit on the sector partnership board. They're intimately aware of kind of how the program works and who might be a good fit. Um, they have an apprenticeship consortium that um, in theory, the candidates who are hiring, you know, the apprenticeship consortium members who are hiring access graduates, we hope that over time our access graduates will matriculate into apprenticeship programs. Um, there, there may end up being kind of a pre-apprenticeship bridge between access and apprenticeship at some point. That's that's a at least a conversation point at the moment. Um, and then in, in general, from a, a manufacturing Cuyahoga County awareness standpoint, always looking to make sure we're synergistic about here are our career paths, here are here's what manufacturing is for job seekers and, and for employers, here's how to engage in these different workforce related mechanisms. Great. Thank you. 
have one more quick question. The gap between um, completers and uh, employment, um, are some of those folks, is, is, is it because they don't have a GED? Like, are, are there remediation um, opportunities for those folks, or they just didn't, weren't really interested in going on to employment? Or um, it's, it's kind of a combination. A lot, like way more people than we would have ever expected chose not to go to employment and had at least one job offer. Um, and then a couple of people weren't ready to work. Uh, and then other people kind of just disappeared after the class. The, um, the unofficial statistic that we like to talk about is that every graduate who is actively looking to work has gotten at least one job offer. The average is more like two. I think the high we've seen is four or five offers for one person. Um, and we're, we're always on the continuous improvement mindset of how do we either screen for or inspire more directly the folks who uh, we've, we've had a couple of really strong graduates that just, uh, you know what, I don't feel like working right now and just blew the coaches minds of, but you could have this great opportunity that has all, I'm like, mm, I'm okay, you know, and the stories of, well, I'm okay right now, my wife's working or, um, yeah, it, it's, it's frustrating, but towards employment does a really good job of staying in touch with both the people who need additional barrier help or um, the timing isn't right for them personally. And, and we've had uh, a fair amount of folks placed a short, somewhere between a short and a significant time later as they work through, which is great. So we had one guy, so I'm sorry, we just, we had one guy who um, was doing really well in his company and he got, a, he won a grant for a food truck. And that was his dream. So he quit and to run a food truck. And we were like, great, follow your dreams. But like our numbers are going to go down now. But <laughs> <laughs> for, for companies who are interested in um, learning more to possibly partner or utilize access, what would the next step be? I was gonna say, you can contact me. I'm really happy to talk to whoever. OK. I don't know, Adam, did you want to have him call you? Yeah, just being mindful of geographically where everybody is in our audience. I would say the, the model is, is currently Cuyahoga County centric from a, from a recruitment standpoint, from a funding standpoint. I think we're, as you see, we're willing to share and towards employment is, uh, is willing to talk about what that would look like. But part of the, part of the nuanced element of success is making sure that the residents and the job opportunities are well aligned culturally and geographically. So we're not introducing transportation barrier issues for folks where that would be hard to, to get around. So, um, you know, as you have facilities that are say Cleveland centric or Cuyahoga County centric or partners or suppliers, introductions to Debbie are a great path. Uh, and then I think where Bernie was, was poking was, this could be a model, a model that could be geographically replicated right. uh, with, with the right partnerships and employer support and um, happy to share about, you know, we touched on some of the braided funding and partnership model and all that. Happy to, happy to introduce that uh, in more detail. It really, it starts every time we end up be, uh, being asked about that, it really starts with the employers having an explicit energy to do it. Because uh, the demand side drives everything else. Got it. And that's low hanging fruit. Like if if the sector partnership and some of our our uh, folks who are on this uh, participating today, um, and even those who are going to listen uh, down the road, um, you know, want to just gather up and have these conversations. Here we've got the experts within twenty miles of us um, to. Uh, really help us and uh, we so value your expertise, uh, Debbie and, and Adam. So thank you so thanks. much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for and the opportunity. You. Thanks for being such an engaged group with lots of questions. And, and I'm gonna do my best to get this posted as soon as possible. I'm out of uh, town right now, but I think I can still get uh, access on my laptop to um, get this posted to the YouTube. So, um, uh, Bernie, you probably want to stop recording to make sure that that um, then. Our